The theme of this paper is the use and abuse uh, of the King Solomon figure in traditions. Uh, traditions, I mean also the Hebrew Bible and the Greek uh, versions. So uh, chapters 1 to 11 describe the story of the King Solomon. Scholars have been debating for years whether the biblical Solomon reflects a historical king or whether it is a product of the literary imagination of the later scribes. And many of you, you know that how heated this discussion was. Despite the inconclusiveness of, uh, advance, of the advanced arguments, uh, a consensus has been reached that the narrative in 1 Kings uh, 111 is highly charged with theological motifs and went through numerous reductions and editorial interventions. So the narrative and its later re-elaboration as preserved in Greek and Hebrew versions represents, I think, and I believe, one of the most elaborated syntheses of biblical political thought. In this political manifest, as I call it, uh, the Israelite scribe telescoped into the ideal King Solomon the political theories of their periods, and I mean different periods, not only one period, in order to explore them and to grasp the impact of the Solomon narrative in the history of reception, so what's happened later with this figure, I will divide this paper into three parts. Uh, first, I will shortly present the principles of the biblical political thought contained in 1 Kings 1.11. Second, I will illustrate how some of these principles were used or maybe abused in the Renaissance. And third, I will apply John or William O'Malley's uh, model of four cultures to classify the streams of reception history of the Solomon political thought. So <clears throat> I will start with uh, political uh, thoughts embedded in 1 Kings 1.11. Well, in order to present the scribes uh, a political thought telescope in the figure of Solomon, I will present the political concepts under three aspects. So what, uh, how they presented their political theory. So what does an ideal king do? So actions, okay? How does an ideal king behave? So his behavior is human or political intellectual profile. And how does an ideal king think? So what are the inner attitudes of the king, his heart? So the, uh, I structuring in this way. So let's see. Uh, uh, what does an ideal king do? Uh, so his actions, his, what he does. So the first thing uh, uh, some, uh, so, uh, Solomon had to do is to resolve the succession crisis because otherwise he would be out of office. So the first two chapters present the political tensions that normally come forward at the end of the reign of a charismatic king such as David and when a new heir is disputed. A successful solution of the succession crisis is a condition sine qua non for consolidation kingship in the hands of a new ruler. Well, and some, Samuel's narrative depicts this terrible dynam dynamics uh, there. So the Hebron faction, represented by Adonijah, was eliminated. Their main representatives were executed like Adonijah and Joab. And Solomon banished a priest, Abiatar, and established his man as uh, chief priest, Zadok, and chief prophet, Nathan. Well, of course, he was basically a terrible king who killed everyone who was against him. Well, how he, they justify it, they find a so-called uh, gut blood guilt principles to say that whatever he did was perfectly okay, but what uh, Joab did was wrong. And this blood guilt theory helped them to resolve this political tension. And if we go to the modern solution, uh, you can see uh, the succession crisis has been uh, present all the time. And uh, to resolve it, of course, it's the basis of the political, of the successful politician. Another aspect is organization of the kingdom. So chapter four presents uh, uh, the offices uh, uh, list the major offices and their holders and the division of the kingdom into provinces, so he was able to do that. Uh, then we have a very sophisticated tax system presented in five, chapter five. We have a good standing uh, army 
for uh, chapter 10. Uh, and then we have a very good uh, division of the forced labor. Uh, he sent them to the Lebanon, 10,000 a month in shifts. Uh, they, were, uh, they would be a month in the Lebanon and two months at home. So you can see also this human aspect of Solomon. And uh, the result is uh, that uh, the kingdom, the Judah and Israel lived in safety. And there is also one very as interesting aspect. Uh, if you read verse chapter 3, verse 15, what Solomon did after his vision in Gibeon, he made a huge feast, drinking and eating with his people, so to gain uh, or gain hearts of his uh, subordinates. So, uh, organization of the kingdom is a key point. Then international relationships, uh, and if we look at uh, um, the Bible, so he married Pharaoh's daughter, Pharaoh's daughter and brought to the court other princesses. Uh, then we have uh, a description of very sophisticated uh, interaction with Tyre and uh, Solomon's commercial enterprises. We uh, read about the commerce, trade of horses, chariots, uh, maybe of arms from Egypt about forced labor, exchange of gifts, uh, and uh, Queen of Saba who came uh, to visit uh, the Solomon, and uh, uh, f fleets going all around the world bringing goods to uh, Jerusalem. However, we know also that this text uh, voiced also some certain perplexity and doubts about Solomon's international relationship, and you know about these uh, famous wives, uh, and uh, even Hiram, who, uh, who received 20 cities, uh, but he didn't like them. Uh, so this is another aspect, and the th uh, fourth aspect of uh, what a good king or, um, does is building activities. So uh, he fortified the city, Jerusalem, building city walls, uh, um, uh, building a good defense systems. Uh, he built palaces, the temple, and the several cities, and even a beautiful ivory throne for himself. So if we think, uh, and I will summarize it in few words or in one picture, uh, you have beautiful Solomon, and if you want to be, what is the basis of the political theory is action. And the action is expressed, uh, I put it in four aspects, so administration, succession crisis to resolve it, uh, international relationship, and building activities. So, so this is what uh, according to this political theory uh, in 1 Kings uh, 11, uh, a good king does. So another aspect is uh, how does a good or ideal king behave? So what is the profile of a good king? Well, many kings built, but what is behind is a profile. So, uh, actual, uh, Solomon's profile is an intellectual profile or very uh, wise king. So, uh, chapter 4, verses 10, 14 describes Solomon's intellectual profile. His wisdom surpassed such sages of the East. He was able to answer the riddles of the Queen of Saba, and the whole world comes to listen to his wisdom. Well, and look at this, he, was, uh, he composed 3,000 proverbs and his songs numbered 1,005. He would speak of trees from cedar, uh, that is uh, the Lebanon to hypsop uh, that grows in the wall. So his knowledge, intellectual breadth is really, really large. And uh, another aspect of his profile is uh, that the king is a pious king. So Solomon prays, and we have a beautiful uh, prayers in chapter 8. Uh, he presides liturgical celebration. He offers sacrifices. Uh, he uh, sings hymns. So this is another layer of the Solomon. So not only what he does, but what he also, what, he, what is his profile, uh, how he behaves. So the next level is... Uh, uh, how do a king think, or what is his vision, what are the hierarchy of his values, what is his heart? And uh, uh, I think that the vision in Gibeon presents what is really important for Solomon. And uh, 
I would present, uh, I don't want to go into the details, but uh, to give a short summary of that research I have done. So the first two chapters, one and two of Kings, uh, present the subtle critique of Saul David models of kingship. And in chapter three, presents uh, Solomon as a model of, the, of a new king and rural, ruler. This no, new model is rooted in the rules of succession and enthronement ritual set up by David, so this is chapter one and two. But the most important shift is from the warrior king presented by Saul and David, and a new king, a kind of king as revealed in Solomon's dream. The long tradition of military rulers started with Abraham, Moses, Josiah, and uh, other uh, military kings this tradition is further developed in 1st and 2nd Samuel, where we have Saul and David, real warrior kings. But uh, after Solomon's dream, royal military campaigns played a minor role in the narratives, and all campaigns led by the Israelite Judai kings ended in defeat or were directly or indirectly condemned by the narrate, narrator. So what we have here, that uh, we have the waning uh, of the warrior model of kingship, and this made room for other characteristics to flourish, and we can observe some of them, promoting justice, concluding international relationship. But these elements represent the basis of the political theories that heavily influence uh, the future generation. And these aspects of the new, new kind of ruler are strictly linked with, uh, in the biblical narrative, with listening heart, with uh, discernment, and with good judgment. So what is a real profile of, that, uh, of Solomon? And we can look at it as a shift from monarchy to democracy in the modern terms. This happened in chapter three shift from warrior king to a king who is a judge, a king who is uh, discerning, uh, who is a prince of peace, as it is interpreted in, uh, uh, in books of Chronicles. Well, uh, so if we now look at uh, uh, this model, and I presented it in this way, what is the deepest mo motivation? So the, the, the deeds, this is the external expression, the profile, intellectual and pious uh, king, but what is really hard, what is coordinating or integrating everything, uh, according to First Kings uh, 3, is listening hard, judgment and discernment. Now, uh, uh, just to wake you up, a uh, couple of profiles of modern re leaders. So we have, for example, this man. <laughs> he has certain profile, okay? Then you have this man. He has a different profile. You have this man, another profile. You have Mandela, different profile. You have the Pope Francis, and you have uh, this man. So if you look at these people, each of them, they have very different profiles, but all of them they built, uh, they have international relationship uh, and other aspects. So now if we translate it into an Ancient Near East, uh, and I pick up a couple of pictures, as the painters presented what is the heart of a king. So look at Solomon. Who is there? He's almost a high priest building the temple. Uh, if you look at this man, David, is an artist. Uh, if you look at uh, Saul, he's a warrior. If you look at Josiah, he's a sort of religious uh, fanatic uh, uh, killing everyone. So you have this kind of uh, presentation. This is artistic presentation. Doesn't mean that it's a reality. <laughs> but uh, the, the, how you define the profiles. Uh, so I, uh, in order to define the profiles, I, uh, I picked up the theory of John William O'Malley of four cultures. Without entering into the detail, it's a fantastic book. It's a synthesis of his almost 40 years of scholarship. He's a Renaissance historian. And he presented, uh, he divided history, or how history is governed and what happened there, into four cultures. So the prophetic culture is a culture where you have some, someone who is, you are good or bad. There is nothing in between. You are with me, and if you are not with me, you are against me. 
you are Christ or you are Antichrist. Uh, and my authority comes from God. And there is no questioning whether you have good reasons or, as you said, that uh, good argument for Torah. Who cares? I have inspiration from God. Then uh, he speaks about academic culture, so arguments and proofs. Uh, but uh, what is important for us is a humanistic culture. A humanistic culture, according to John O'Malley, is very different. Uh, well, you're right, but also I am right. Let's find a common ground. Uh, what is common good? Uh, what leads to something like to inspire some people? Uh, and uh, we don't speak about the arguments. We speak about heart, motivation, poetry, uh, literature, and this uh, is a completely different world. And uh, then uh, he speaks about so-called artistic culture, and uh, I don't go into the details. But uh, so now, if you look at Solomon, how he is presented, so what is a heart, what would be the culture of Solomon? I would call him a typical humanist king. Because what is the basis of the humanist, uh, humanism was discernment, good judgment, distinction between good and evil, and Solomon is presented in this way. Now, if we look at the, uh, what's happened with this figure later on, uh, I would present uh, uh, a Solomon narrative was adjusted in the High Renaissance, and uh, I picked up uh, this man, uh, Gran Cardinale Alessandro Farnese. The reason is very simple, because those of you who are living in Rome, you know who sponsored uh, Chiesa del Gesù, who is a basic church of the Jesuits, and I'm a Jesuit, uh, was Alessandro Farnese. In good or in bad, he was our basic sponsor. So uh, let's look at him. So, uh, Alessandro Farnese was a great religious prelate and at the same time a uh, worldly humanist. Without exaggerating, uh, we can say that he was the most important politician, diplomat, and humanist of the 16th century and the richest person in Rome. And these are some uh, biographic data. So, he was a grandson of Paul um, III. Well, in that period, it uh, was normal to have uh, children for the popes. Uh, then uh, he became cardinal when he was 14 years old, so that's a different thing. <laughs> uh, he was surrounded by beauty, uh, best artists, scholars, and so on. And uh, he built all these uh, beautiful uh, buildings in Rome. Well, he has some weakness uh, for women. and. Uh, <laughs> He was not very good in that, and he had also one uh, daughter. Uh, and this daughter caused him a lot of problems. So, uh, well, if we now look, uh, and I would like to see uh, the, uh, the interpretation of uh, Solomon figure in, uh, uh, so the, these are the offices he had. So he was one of the richest person in, uh, in Rome because he was almost everywhere, and he was organizing everything. So he built this, uh, or uh, they renewed this palace, uh, Villa Capraola, uh, uh, in Capraola, Villa Farnese. And uh, so if you look at the, the paintings here, so these are two floors, and where you have the arrow, so this is the uh, Stanza dei Giudici, uh, Giudici uh, the, the Room of Judgment. And uh, so what is there is, uh, uh, so this was the entrance to the, uh, from the gardens, and according to art historian, uh, this was a place where he received uh, the audiences. So this is a very important element. You can imagine that you are one of these big bishops or, I don't know, diplomats of the world. Where do you come? You come to this room of judgment. Okay, what do you find in this room of judgment? Uh, you find uh, all these frescoes here, and let's start with uh, uh, the, the most important, which is uh, frescoes in the ceiling, and this is if, exactly the figure of uh, Solomon there. Uh, without entering into too many details, if you look at it, this is a judgment of Solomon. It is presented in uh, so-called uh, mannerist style, but what is important if you look at the nuances, how the king was able to distinguish evil from good. And uh, it's beautifully expressed uh, through the shades uh, of there. Now, if this is a main ceiling, so you, have, you come and you see it over there, 
all the other fresh scores are supporting what this judgment is about. And of course, you are in this room, Salomon is here, and I'm here, Alessandro Farnese. So who is now the incarnation of, of uh, Salomon? It's me, Alessandro Farnese. Uh, so this is uh, how he presented uh, himself, and uh, so a uh, couple of uh, things we can see how, for example, what does it mean to be a good judge, uh, like Moses distributed offices, uh, and he was the highest judge, and also Alessandro Farnese was the highest judge. He uh, distributed offices. Or what is very important is uh, this fresco when, uh, uh, what is he distributing, uh, like Aaron was distributing offices uh, and priests, so Cardinal Farnese had to distribute uh, official, uh, 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 the offices in the church. And if you look at the hats, so all of them are heads of Aaron, but one, I hope you can see it, and he's a bishop head. Uh, then if you look at the next fresco, we can see how uh, Alexandro Farnese was building, building churches and building projects, exactly the same what Salomon was supposed to do. Um, and then uh, if we look at the next fresco, so we can see the details of uh, uh, David, uh, who was uh, reproached by Nathan and he, uh, who killed Amalekite. So he was supposed to find also all these hidden intrigues and Alessandro was very good in that. So if you look at uh, the next picture, we can see that Salomon uh, was a model of the humanistic culture. So what was uh, the integrating element of Salomon was basically his heart, discerning heart, and it was expressed through intellectual profile, pious piety, and uh, of course, uh, in his deeds. If you look at Alexandro Sarnese, he completely accepted this model. He became this kind of humanistic uh, king, and uh, he, uh, the central point was this listening heart as judge, uh, good judgment, as uh, Salomon had. Of course, it was expressed through his intellectual profile, and if you look at Caprarola and the people who were there, he was in touch with the best scholars of the world, best artists, best humanists of that world. And you can see it, for example, in his composition of the room of the maps. And what he did was also excellent administration, building activities, international relationship. He was the one who coordinated the peace between Charles V and Francis I. So what we can say that uh, we have uh, this beautiful image of uh, um, Salomon on the one hand, uh, Alessandro Farnese, who incarnated this model of humanistic culture. Of course, uh, who is now a new Salomon? Of course, it's uh, Alessandro Farnese. So now, if we go uh, to the next step, uh, I would show that this history of interpretation of Salomon, can be, you can find different models how Salomon was interpreted. And I gave you a couple of examples, like, for example, Robert of Naples, or the trial of witches in Salem uh, were, was inspired by Salomon's trial, and the Mughal Empire or other uh, paintings were inspired by this Salomon's picture. And we can see how, uh, if you allow me to divide it in, uh, as a prophetic culture. Prophetic culture meaning uh, that good or bad, and if you are not with me, you have to die. And for example, Crusaders, and we will hear about it, uh, the whole reasoning behind was also uh, supported by Solomon. And we have the documents and paintings for that. Uh, on the other hand, we have a humanistic interpretation of Alessandro Farnese, and we can find also this academic culture and artistic culture. So uh, my conclusion is that uh, Solomon presented in the Bible over the centuries of interpretation as we have it in Hebrew and Greek text was charged with certain presentation, certain political thought. And this political thought was not that of Josiah, not that of Jehu, 
not that of David, but it represents a new style which I would allow to call a humanistic style. And this style was picked up later on, and one of the best examples where it was incarnated was, for example, Alexander Farnese, or others who picked up other elements, like chapter one and two, for example, Crusaders, they were supporting or building much more on chapter one on two. So thank you very much. Uh,